Over 100 dead, hundreds still missing as Kenya investigates a lethal cult. Two pastors have been arrested while the search for bodies continues. Shocked Kenyans are calling for a crackdown on religious fringe groups and asking their government how this could happen. But they are not alone, as authorities around the world struggle to separate dangerous cults from religious freedom. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmakers are cults. Paul Ntenge McKenzie is due to appear in court next week. The Christian pastor is accused of ordering his followers to starve themselves to death in order to get to heaven before his predicted end of the world on April 15th. Kenyan President William Ruto describes McKenzie as a terrorist, saying he used religion to radicalize thousands, many of whom are now dead. The deaths amount to one of the worst cult-related tragedies in recent history, and with hundreds still missing, the toll is expected to rise. <laughs> Outside an overcrowded morgue in the coastal town of Malindi, relatives of the victims of the Kenyan starvation cult are waiting to identify their loved ones. My children are dead. I know that for sure. Kenyans have been left shocked by the news. In these shallow graves, marked with sticks and yellow tape, investigators have dug up over a hundred bodies. And with every passing day, more are being found. Many of them children. While some were rescued alive, they were desperately weak. The information received is that uh, the people there were being starved after being radicalized by a certain uh, member of a church who told them that uh, their, their work in this world is done and that they are waiting for, they should die and go and see their, their creator. Followers of the Good News International Church are thought to have starved themselves to death in hopes of going to heaven. The church leader, Paul McKenzie, was arrested earlier this month when police raided his property. He's accused of brainwashing his followers and leading them to their deaths. The government has described it as a massacre and promised to bring those responsible to justice. The government of Kenya will do whatever it takes to make sure that we convict Mr. McKenzie and all those who helped him perpetrate his heinous crimes. McKenzie has been arrested multiple times in 2017 in connection with a range of offenses. Just last month, he was arrested on suspicion of the murder of two children by starvation, then released on bail. Some Kenyan lawmakers have criticized the security services for missing opportunities to prevent the deaths. The president has even likened him to a terrorist. Terrorists use religion to advance their heinous acts. People like Mr. McKenzie are using religion to do exactly the same thing. The gruesome saga has led to calls for a crackdown on fringe religious groups in the predominantly Christian country, where some leaders are suspected of using extreme teachings that put their followers' lives at risk. There are, there are many other people we are in, uh, uh, following up, we are interested in, whom we believe are involved in similar, similar issues. So there is a lot more happening, uh, not just this person. This is one of the worst cult-related tragedies in recent history. And with the Kenyan Red Cross saying more than 300 people are still missing, it's feared the worst may be yet to come. Well, given what's been uncovered already, it's hard to believe that it could get worse. But as we've seen in examples around the world, the power of cults can lead to tragedies beyond imagination. From the near 1,000 deaths of the Jonestown Massacre to the smaller but some say equally shocking Heaven's Gate suicides led by Marshall Applewhite. In 1995, Aum Shinrikyo's Tokyo subway sarin gas attack left almost 6,000 people injured and 13 dead. And in Waco, Texas, a massive fire killed dozens of Branch Davidians after a 51-day siege of their compound. 
Those tragedies and others have left governments the world over struggling to regulate dangerous cults that claim to operate under freedom of religion. So, to talk more about the deaths in Kenya, as well as how lawmakers can better balance freedom of religion with the existence of cults, are from Trenton, New Jersey, Rick Ross, the founder and executive director of the Cult Education Institute. He's also the author of Cults Inside Out, How People Get In and Can Get Out. And from Nairobi is Bobby Mkangi, a constitutional lawyer and the chairperson of the Eastern African Center for Constitutional Development. Thanks both so much for being with me. Bobby, I'll start with you in Kenya. I mean, tell me what's struck you most about this case. And legally, does it qualify then as, as murder? Well, the first thing is it's definitely shocking uh, to hear of, uh, especially the number of the people who have uh, uh, passed away uh, this way. Uh, not shocking in the sense of uh, the running or operation of such uh, religious institutions and per se churches, but in the uh, revelation that uh, there were deaths which are now emanating as uh, cult deaths. Uh, in as much as we've been having um, in the country, uh, the mushrooming of such uh, churches, which many suspect are uh, sects or uh, cults. Uh, we've really never had a situation where uh, deaths uh, are reported. Most of the times it's uh, churches or people who start churches uh, with a view of uh, fleecing Kenyans or making money right. uh, from uh, innocent Kenyans. But it's never gotten to this extreme where uh, people are losing lives. And to the extent uh, of this large number uh, of, of, of lives where uh, we are still counting uh, the, the people who may have lost uh, their lives and many others are still uh, being reported uh, as, as, as missing. Uh, in terms of the law, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a big mystery right now and it's a big challenge uh, for the authorities uh, as to what uh, charges may be preferred. Uh, against uh, uh, whoever may be found culpable, because when you look mm -hmm. at uh, the elements of, say, for for instance, the, the, the offense of murder as per the penal code in Kenya, uh, you find that uh, uh, unless the police can, um, or the investigators and the prosecutors can eventually uh, uh, prod out what uh, I would call uh, the smoking gun, uh, of which right now uh, the only thing that seems to be uh, plausible um, is it uh, the, the sermons, are the sermons or the teachings uh, of the preacher, uh, then it is going to be very difficult uh, to pin him down or others uh, on this offense. Um, the probable offense, again, may be assisted uh, suicide, uh, but again, uh, there has to be the question as to whether uh, the, the teachings or the sermons okay. uh, were directed towards this. I, I do want to talk more about the legal aspect, Bobby, but uh, first let me cross over to Rick and ask uh, the same question. I mean, your impressions of this case and, and what struck you about it, because we've seen this a lot in the United States, and they're extremely sensational when it happens, but this prolonged starvation of these cult members, that I'm not sure we've quite seen before. Uh, no, this is uh, somewhat unique, uh, though sadly, this is a tragedy that's played out a number of times. And I would say that the leader, uh, Paul McKenzie, exercised coercive control over the people that followed him. That is, that they relied on his judgment uh, for him to make value judgments for them. And he used doomsday prophecies and uh, the Bible in order to create a kind of atmosphere of fear where he could leverage more intense control. Mackenzie himself uh, believes in a more or less uh, a version of what was taught by a, a pastor in the United States, William Branham, who died in 1965. And his followers were called the Brahmanites. They focused on the idea that the end was imminent and that Branham was the end times prophet. And uh, many of them engaged in what's called deliverance ministry, casting out demons, ascribing virtually anything to demonic possession, which Mackenzie did as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Mackenzie's group, they were isolated from the world. Uh, Branham kind of cocooned them in the idea that only he had the truth. 
and they must rely on his truth and his truth alone. Very similar, Mackenzie did not want the children to go to school. He apparently isolated them from the outside world. Uh, and like many cult leaders, he chose uh, to move them into a place where he could control them, an environment where he could dictate their daily lives. Right. Uh, you know, Rick, though, what's fascinating about this case in Kenya, though, is that, yes, he, he got the children as followers as well, or forced, um, but then went ahead to kill them, not die with them, as per his prophecy that the end of the world was coming, and they all had to, or should have had to, meet their creator together. Why would he do that? Why would he want to kill the very people that had gathered around him to be so faithful and, and follow his teachings. That's why I'd asked uh, Bobby earlier, is, does this qualify as murder? Because he went on to live and he's still in a healthy condition while he made his followers suffer and die for the end that he had predicted. Yeah, the, I would say that Mackenzie is very similar to the Japanese cult leader Shoko Asahara who also predicted the end and gassed the Tokyo subway system to bring it on. A at the end, they found him with a huge amount of cash in hiding. So he was not willing to make the sacrifice that his followers made. Uh, but Mackenzie uh, is also similar to Joseph Kibwe Kibwetere, who led a group in Uganda called the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments. He predicted the end would come in 2000. And when it didn't, he began killing his followers. Eventually, they recovered over 750 bodies in Uganda, though, it, though I think due to the extreme isolation of the group in the jungle, there may have been many more people that died. It may have actually topped Jonestown. Mm. Uh, but Kibwetere died with his followers. Jim Jones, who, who led almost 1,000 people to death, Americans that transplanted in British Guyana uh, in 1978, he also died with his followers. But apparently, Mackenzie did not want to do that. Uh, right. many, of the, many of these cult leaders are deeply narcissistic. At, 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 the, at, the, uh, at the point of wanting their followers to comply with them, in order to reaffirm their unique stature, their, their special mission. Uh, but Mackenzie's narcissism did not include dying with his followers. Mm. Apparently, apparently, he felt that it was more important for him to live. It, you know, if you can, Rick, give us just a better idea of the kinds of people that would follow, in, I mean, in most cases, men like this. What is it they're lacking? What is it that they're after when they, when they join these cults? Well, I, I think uh, it could be anyone. Uh, there have been many people that I've worked with over the years. Uh, I've, I've done over 500 interventions around the world. And of those interventions, five were medical doctors. One was an anesthesiologist. One was an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so it could be anyone, any level of education, any social economic background. Uh, what they share in common is that they were deceived. They were deceived by a leader who gradually drew them in through, through isolation, typically, and, and by basically using something that has authority, for example, mm -hmm. the Bible. Uh, I think Mackenzie told them, look, uh, this is not about me. This is about God. This is about the Word of God. And then he twisted the scriptures in order to enable him to control and manipulate the people. Right. I, I think that some of them may have been going through a difficult time in their lives, which made it more, uh, more prescient. Uh, they were more vulnerable than they otherwise would have been to Mackenzie's message. But basically, I blame the leader not the people. And I think that we need to disabuse ourselves of the idea that a certain type of person mm. can, be, uh, can be recruited by a cult when in fact we're all vulnerable because these groups basically lie and deceive people, trick them into becoming trapped in the group. Right, but that's, that's where it becomes tricky legally. 
uh, to go after cases like this. I mean, Bobby, you tell us how difficult it is actually to prosecute. Uh, federal authorities have mentioned genocide in this case. That might have a lot of trouble holding up in court. But what charges could actually lead to an appropriate punishment? Because the argument for those being prosecuted is that these are not victims, they are just followers. They are just believers like the leader themselves. Exactly, and I think uh, hot on the heels of what uh, Rick Ross was saying, um, that uh, at the end of the day, uh, perhaps uh, what the authorities may have to rely on and what I was calling uh, the smoking gun, because uh, for there to be criminal culpability, there has to be a connection between uh, uh, the, uh, Mackenzie himself, uh, his activities, and what led to the deaths, uh, so as to occasion that as, as, as a killing. And then beyond that is to now uh, carve out the intention, uh, whether it was malicious or not. If it was malicious, then that uh, occasions murder. If not, uh, then that is a manslaughter. And in, in for both of these offenses, uh, which would be the most extreme and strictest and the ones which may deliver uh, the, the, the ultimate uh, and, and optimal uh, sanctions, uh, then you find the difficulty in uh, connecting so far with the, with the evidence. Perhaps the authorities and the investigators may have more and will get more information, but so far what is available, uh, you find that there is a difficulty of yeah. connecting um, his uh, sermons, his teachings, um, mm. uh, in as much as was saying uh, there is an element of uh, uh, control, uh, but that's what the prosecutors will have to try and piece together. And it's not uh, easy. The, uh, Bobby, the, let me ask you, though, I mean, yeah. from, from what you've seen in the investigation so far, I mean, did the government and local authorities really drop the ball at some point? Did they ignore signs that could have saved lives? And I mean, because the government is actually now saying that there are a lot more people involved so, I mean, how widespread is this and how could they not have gotten on this earlier? Exactly. Apart from in, in terms of uh, regulating the, the, the number of uh, such uh, groups, uh, re religious organizations that have been mushrooming uh, in the country uh, for the past 20 or so years, uh, there's an the issue of, um, uh, and it's particularly with the Mackenzie case, um, he has been arrested severally. Uh, in fact, as of yesterday, the judiciary of Kenya had to issue a press statement describing and outlining the activities uh, and, 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 and its interface uh, with Mackenzie uh, since uh, right around 2017. On a number of occasions, he has been arrested, uh, uh, arraigned in court, yeah. uh, but, you know, been given what you may call a slap on the wrist. Uh, and uh, a number of uh, uh, families uh, or relatives of the victims are coming out to report that they have been to the police on a number of occasions reporting right. uh, these incidents, but the police did not take uh, action. So it remains to be seen whether it was uh, because of corruption, because that's uh, another very big problem uh, with uh, criminal, the criminal justice system. Uh, here in Kenya, but also, again, there's a problem, uh, as I was describing earlier, of uh, really pinning down uh, the offences. So, exactly. yes, uh, yeah. may have thought, but the police may, on some occasions, uh, may have really, as per the law books, uh, failed to see what to really uh, uh, arrest and charge uh, right. Mr. McKenzie. Let me come back to Rick, because there is this question of legislation and law enforcement here and how to distinguish, actually, uh, between a cult and a church. You know, plenty of people accuse Scientology, for example, of being a cult, yet in the United States it has the even tax-free status of being a church. And then there's religious freedom versus an illegal cult. Followers of Waco and the Branch Davidians still blame the government for illegally raiding their compound and directly causing the deaths of dozens of Branch Davidians. So, I mean, what are really the limits of the government and law enforcement here? Well, first, uh, I would define a cult uh, in very narrow terms. Uh, number one, that there is the existence of an absolute authoritarian leader who is the defining element and driving force of the group who becomes an object of worship. Uh, McKenzie fits that description. Second, uh, that there is coercive control use that can be identified. That is, people are under undue influence and they're acting against their own best interests 
but consistently in the best interest of the leader. And I think McKenzie has proven that certainly uh, with his followers. And number three, that the leader does damage to the people's lives. And I think the complaints generated about McKenzie historically demonstrate that he has a history of doing damage to his followers and exploiting them. Uh, having said that, look, Charlie Manson, one of the most notorious cult leaders in the United States, was convicted of murder, sent to prison, and died there. Mm -hmm. He was not one of the physical assailants of the victims. What he was convicted for was the control that he exercised over his followers, that he weaponized them, and then they killed for Charlie Manson. Mm. And on that basis, he was convicted of murder. Uh, in this situation, I think it, it is reasonable to conclude that the reason that people starved themselves to death, the reason they allowed their own children to starve to death, was the undue influence of Paul McKenzie. Mm -hmm. Now, how that will play out in court uh, is, is a question, but there are hundreds of sermons of McKenzie that have been online mm -hmm. and that they can establish that this was a preconceived a uh, notion of his that they should, in fact, sacrifice their lives because the end of the world was coming. Right. And so I, I think there is a way to convict him. And I think that the way that the government can regulate these groups is demand financial transparency and examine groups very closely when they generate complaints. I mean, Rick, I'll just ask you this. What can you do? for people who continue to refuse to believe, though, that they, that they are victims, that they've been brainwashed, uh, and that insist that this is free choice and that the government really has no right to interfere. Because you can have the laws in order, you can have examples like Charles Manson, but if people say this is their free choice and this is freedom of religion, how do you deter this? Uh, well, I think that you, first of all, you regulate the groups, expect financial transparency and accountability from them regarding the amounts of money they have, the property they have. Would which you makes worry then about a group like Scientology that we've heard numerous well, complaints about, but is, is being uh, monitored? Their transactions have to be transparent, but still. Yeah, well, Scientology has limited accountability mm -hmm. in the United States due to separation of church and state. I think you could say that the United States offers a haven for many groups that would otherwise be under much more scrutiny in other countries. For example, in the EU, in Australia, in other countries, uh, China, uh, groups have more accountability and the government expects them to account for uh, their finances in much more detail than in the United States. Perhaps that's why so many of these groups called cults have found that the United States is a convenient place to set up shop. Mm. Uh, but, but what can families do? I think families can intervene. They can talk about their concerns with a family member who is under the influence of a leader like McKenzie. Uh, my book, Cults Inside Out, goes into great detail about how this can be done. And of course, there must be a level of cooperation from the person who is involved. But typically, if the family is close, if their friends are close, they can say, look, uh, we, we just want to talk to you about this. Yeah. We want to discuss our concerns with you. Okay. And hopefully that can be a pathway out. Bobby, just a minute and a half left. What ideally do you want to see happen in Kenya now against these alleged cult leaders that have been taken in? Uh, to rectify what has happened to these over 100 victims? Well, uh, definitely, uh, uh, at the end of the day, and I think this is what most, uh, if not all Kenyans want, is uh, for this particular case, for uh, Mr. McKenzie uh, to be found uh, culpable and uh, to be visited with uh, the uh, best possible um, sanction that the law may avail depending on eventually what the prosecution will prefer, whether it's genocide, murder, uh, or you know, mass-assisted uh, mass suicide. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think, uh, as Rick Ross say, in as much as we have um, uh, 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 sort of, sort of a good regulatory uh, regimen in the country right now, uh, because these churches or religious organizations must be registered with the government, so and most of them do so that they can benefit from 
the registration, say tax exemption um, uh, from uh, their tithes and, and, and uh, donations. Uh, but I think it's okay. high time now we the country comes up with a specific uh, regulatory framework uh, for churches and re uh, religious organizations. Bobby uh, Mkongi, yeah, that, that will have to be the final word. I'd like to thank you so much uh, for all your insights and to Rick Ross as well. Thanks so much for being with us and to our viewers, of course, for tuning in. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.